our final but most favorite and special speaker of the weekend. Uh, she is a quack-fighting feminist mom who contributes to Grounded Parents, Genetic Literacy Project, Forbes, and Skeptic. She is a science popularizer and activist and freelance writer. Uh, her writing has appeared, oh gosh, excuse me while I just repeat myself. Anyway, she has co-written a book, Fear Babe, Shattering Vanny Harry's Glass House. And um, welcome to the stage, Coven Synapathy. Hi everyone, can you, is that working? Can you hear me? Well first, thanks to everybody for staying for the very last talk, I appreciate it. And it's just really gonna be worth your while. So me, I'm not really that cool in person, but that's me with the science sword that I've, I'm a little bit known for in certain circles. Um, and this is the time that you can follow all of my social media feeds. So my public page on Facebook is right there. Um, Twitter, at Synopathy and Mammoths. I'll talk about that later. That's an organization that I co-founded, which stands for March Against Myths. Um, I know we have a, a lot of former Christians here, some former Muslims, but um, I guess in a way I'm a former atheist. I, I kind of have a unique upbringing in that I was raised by a very staunch atheist father and I was just so rebellious that I now consider myself agnostic. So, um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so I had some, some conflict with my parents, but they're great, they're, they're wonderful grandparents. Um, so that's something unique about me. And my book, um, just for reference, I put The Food Babe Way next to, to my book, The Fear Babe, which I co-authored with the wonderful Mark Alsip, who writes a blog called Bad Science Debunked, and Mark Draco. And I'm not you know, that vain that I would just put my picture on the, on the cover of a book for the fun of it, but as you can see, it is a mirroring of the Food Babe way. So um, some of you may be familiar with Food Babe, the, the self-given, actually her, her husband gave her the name, Food Babe. Her actual name is Vani Hari. She's a self-proclaimed food activist um, with quite a following. And she is well known for the statement that there's no amount of chemicals that is acceptable to ingest ever. Um, <laughs> so the, the, our book, The Fear Babe, Shattering Vani Hari's Glass House, it's, it's over 400 pages. And a lot of people ask, why spend a 400 page book talking about the food babe? And really what it is, is it uses the food babe, who I um, believe is one of the biggest misinformation vectors of our time when it comes to food and health. So it debunks a lot of her claims, but really discusses some of the most popular myths and misinformation about food today, but then also uses her as a framework to examine why these myths continue to proliferate in the face of mountains against them. Um, some of the criticism that Vani Hari, the food babe, gets is she's not an expert. She's, she's not a scientist. She's not a, a registered dietitian or uh, an expert nutritionist. And, and I'm not a scientist either. But, and, and people say, what, what makes you any different or any better than the food babe? What gives you the right to write about these issues um, and to write an entire book about these issues? Well, um, and, and I've discussed this with journalists, and even some of them don't understand this. There is a big difference, as, as you all know, between cherry picking and consensus, right? Um, Vani Hari, for her blog, she has a board of advisors. And they, they kind of feature the who's who of food and health woo. Whereas the people that I and my co-authors consult with are experts, scientists, farmers, and, and we really just try to make sure we get the information right. So that's the main difference. Um, my book is out right now, and it'll be out on, it's out on hardcover, and it'll be out on Kindle and Nook um, at the end of the month. So what am I here to talk to you about today? 
Um, the, the, the name of my talk is Word to Your Mother, She Doesn't Know Best, GMO Edition. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of blame Lauren for this. I came up with the name, but I emailed her and I said, can I call my talk Word to Your Mother, She Doesn't Know Best? Because I've been getting mixed messages about this. And Lauren said it was hilarious, so I went with it. So it's supposed to be funny. <laughs> So the anti-GMO camp is largely funded by uh, a certain industry. Uh, would anyone care to take a guess what that industry is? The organic industry, that's right. Um, and the, the anti-GMO leadership really uses the, exploits the fear of parents, and really moms in particular, now that is sexist, but that is, that's what they do, um, to, to advance their own agenda. I, I also um, co-authored and started a campaign called the Moms for GMOs campaign, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, but it's hashtag moms number four GMOs. Um, oh. Okay. Hello? Oh, okay. The Moms for GMOs campaign. Um, and we wrote a letter as well, primarily because we, we realized that the anti-GMO leadership was using celebrity moms uh, as, as kind of props in this movement. Um, and, and these moms were saying things like, um, it's our right to know as moms what, uh, what's in our food. And when you frame it as a right to know what you're feeding your children, it seems very sinister to take that right away, right? Um, so another, another poll, um, and, and be totally honest here, I, there's no judgment. How many of you are wary about GMOs or even anti-GMO? One, two, a few out there, okay. And then how many of you would consider yourself pro-GMO? All right. And anyone um, think that there's no such thing as a GMO? <laughs> okay. Oops, someone's phone is up here. It's Dinging, but that's okay. All right. So, I hope you can read this. This is a little quiz I use sometimes. Which of the following are GMOs? Corn engineered with a gene from Bacillus thuringiensis, a bacteria, to express an inst insecticidal protein. Corn created by scientists crossing genetically homozygous corn genomes, resulting in resulting in more robust heterozygous varieties. These are commercialized and sold. And then the third one, watermelon created by crossing a parent with four sets of chromosomes with a parent with two sets. The offspring with three sets cannot complete the process of meiosis, rendering, rendering it sterile and unable to produce seeds. Uh, I, I particularly enjoy those. Um, number four, papaya with a short viral sequence in its genome allowing it to resist harmful ring spot infection. Five, kiwi created by applying a chemical to induce multiplication of the number of chromosomes, called polyploidy, causing the fruit to be larger and more commercially viable. Six, apple created with reduced expression of the enzyme that causes it to turn brown. It'll still brown when rotten, but not when bitten. And seven, grapefruit created by exposure to gamma radiation to induce artificial genetic mutations, and those with beneficial mutations are then commercialized and sold. Not sure who's f I'm not sure whose phone is this, but I'm gonna set it over here. <laughs> anyway, you can see that um, there are quite a few breeding methods up there on the screen, up there on the screen. And I'm not gonna give you the answers right now, but only three of these are considered quote unquote GMOs by journalists, regulatory and com uh, commercial entities. So as you can see, it's an arbitrary definition. Um, there's this kind of false, well not kind of, there's a false dichotomy between um, natural and unnatural, organic and quote unquote GMO. Again, I don't like this term, for the, but the, for the purpose of this presentation, I'll use the term GMO. And I, I often use it when I write as well. Um, but really, the vast majority of the food we eat is, is, 
has been created in artificial ways. And people often say, well, selective breeding and uh, hybridization, these are natural. But as you can see, there are, there are a lot of other very unnatural way, ways that the food we eat has been created. So I think of the, the GMO labeling movement as the first step um, for the, the big wigs and the anti-GMO movement to eliminate the technology. And they've admitted as much. So why talk about moms? So on the left here, we have this cartoon of a mom with a kid, and the kid is reaching for the organic apples. And, um, you know, when your kid wants something or has a desire for something, you want to give it to them. And so we see we're organic, $1.67 a pound. We're not, $1.27 a pound. Um, does something seem wrong there? Just, just that part? It's a, yeah, it's a much bigger difference. Um, and then you see in the cart, snack, soda, chips, um, the mom's bag, her designer bag, $175, her shoes. Um, and the caption says, oh, sweetie, I'm so sorry, we just can't afford the organic apple. Why not pick one of these instead? So this is, um, this is essentially mom shaming, right? Why should the mom um, have to pay more for organic, which there, there really isn't any health or environmental reason to do so, but um, I won't fully get into that in this presentation today. Um, it's, it's implying that she's selfish and that she cares more about herself than, her, than the child in the cart, which is simply not the case. And then um, on the right, you see a, me a meme that says, a worried mom does better research than the FBI. Um, I saw this on Facebook the other day and thought it was very relevant. But someone commented um, that, I, she said something to the effect of, I've been in CSI training and I'm pretty sure that there weren't worried moms taking cadaver fingerprints. <laughs> but so there's also this um, false idea that having a child or giving birth somehow endows a mother or a parent with, uh, with additional wisdom that is simply not there. It's a fairy tale. It's a fantasy. Yes, we worry about our children, but it doesn't magically give us the ability to discern the truth or to understand science or to sift through Google um, and go through the misinformation on the internet and find what's credible. So next, um, we'll do a brief myth busting about some of the most um, ubiquitous myths, GMO myths, and it's brought to you by March Against Myths. There you see the, the three co-founders, I'm in the middle. And then on the left, there is Dr. Carl Haro von Mogel. He's a geneticist. And on the right, David Sutherland, who is a uh, vegan animal rights activist. I'm not vegan. <laughs> but the three of us got together. Uh, Dave, David lives in Chicago, and Carl and I live in Madison, Wisconsin. And every year, there's an organization called March Against Monsanto, which I'm sure some of you have heard of that was started six years ago as an anti-GMO grassroots organization, um, anti-industrial farming, uh, kind of just anti-corporate sentiment. But since then, they have kind of veered into conspiracy theory territory, right? They're anti-vax. They believe in chemtrails. They, they believe that autism is called by, caused by all manner of things except for the actual causes of autism. <laughs> so, we were uh, on Twitter one day and we thought, um, hey, we should march against the March Against Myths. And, and David's like, yeah, we could call it M-A-M-A-M or Mam Mam. And then one of us was like, if we did it at Madison, we could call it March Against, March Against Monsanto at Madison. So it'd be Mam Mam Mam. But, um, <laughs> but instead, uh, we, act, we started a legit organization called March Against Myths about modification. And we had our first international counter-protest last May. 
where we congregated um, in cities across the United States, as well as Canada, Australia, and the Netherlands. And we're always hoping for more chapters, so, so let me know if you're interested. But the three of us got together in Chicago um, for our, our local counter-protest. And I should say we started Mammoths not only because these are science issues and because we simply want to break down myths, but because, um, because it's a social ju justice issue. Um, genetic modification, genetic engineering is a, a necessary tool in a toolbox to, to help feed the world and uh, take care of our environment. So this slide is just a picture I enjoy of uh, the scene in Chicago, uh, the, the march against Monsanto folks. I don't have any pic, um, pictures of them in the slideshow, but their, their signs were full of expletives. They're very vitriolic, angry. You know, there were people um, posing as bees and collapsing on the ground. It was very theatrical, which is fine. You know, I like a little drama, <laughs> but, but our, our signs were more fact-based, right? Uh, fact number one, farmers have never been sued for cross-pollination. It simply hasn't happened um, that a farmer has been sued for unintentional cross-pollination. We had other signs like, genetic engineering saved the, the Hawaiian papaya. Um, so we were more peaceful, but um, I mean, I, I did get into it a little bit with a couple of the activists, and I'll tell you about that later. Um, and here's one of my favorite pictures from, from the first March Against Myths event. Um, it's there, in that picture, you'll see the entirety of the New York City chapter of March Against Myths. It's a very brave man uh, by the name of Chauncey, and he went all by himself to the March Against Monsanto in New York City, which, which had quite a big turnout, and he went by himself and marched with a sign that, that said, asked me why I love GMOs. And Bill Nye was there checking out the scene. Um, Bill Nye, if, if you're familiar with his recently changed stance on, on um, agricultural genetic engineering, he used to be wary about it and he came out with a statement that said essentially that he changed his mind. Um, Bill Nye went up to Chauncey and they had a nice conversation about why Chauncey was there all by himself. Um, and this, this kind of is very uh, demonstrative of the David against Goliath myth that, you know, anti-GMO activists are the David against the big agrochemical, big ag biotech Goliath. And, and that's simply not the case. People will say, follow the money. That's why there's GMOs in all of our food. Well, you similarly have to follow the money um, when you're looking at the anti-GMO camp. So next, we'll go through a few myths. This is from a series that Mammoths did um, called Facts Not Fear, when um, at the same time in the month of September, um, the Organic Consumers Association decided to do um, their own kind of fact, uh, meme facts, which weren't fact-based at all. So, Here's one of them. Um, there's one of the biggest, if not the most common myths about organic farming is that it doesn't use pesticides, whereas organic use, allows the use of pesticides that are approved by the same processes that conventional farming um, and farmers who use um, genetically engineering crops, genetically engineered crops use. Um, and we'll hear the term toxic pesticides used to describe those um, used on genetically engineered crops. So, so there's this idea that, that these pesticides are toxic, whereas those used on organic uh, crops are not toxic. The, by definition, pesticides are toxic to something. I mean, it's there to kill something. <laughs> so. Um, and often, and this is a big generalization, but often organic farmers have to use more insecticides and herbicides because the, the chemicals that they use are simply not as effective as the synthetic ones. Okay, glyphosate. 
the active ingredient in Roundup is the uh, herbicide that the anti-GMO leadership loves to hate. Um, it's, it's blamed for all kinds of health problems. It's blamed for autism, cancer, even mental health. And, and we'll, get, we'll get into that uh, a little bit later. But here's another meme from, from March Against Myth. Did you know that glyphosate is 25 times less toxic than caffeine? Caffeine's a neurotoxin classified by the International Agency for Research on Cancer as a possible carcinogen. So one thing that the, um, the anti-GMO side relies on is the lack of knowledge or understanding of the central tenet of, a central tenet of toxicology, that the dose makes the poison. Everything at a certain dose or a so certain mode of action is going to be harmful. And um, I, I brought up the IARC because it's often brought up um, to, to defend the, the, this idea that glyphosate is horrible and harmful and a big ploy by Monsanto to control the economy, to control agriculture, and that's simply not the case. People also um, say that they choose non-GMO certified or organic certified food because they're worried about their family's health, um, especially moms worried about their children's health. The truth is there have been zero health effects, I mean, not even a sniffle that people have suffered from eating GMOs over the past 20 years. And then contrast that with um, some of what we've missed out on because of overregulation um, and fear and lobbying based on ideology. For example, the estimated number of human life years lost in the last decade as a result of delays in approving GMO golden rice in India has been 1.4 million life years. I should also mention that golden rice is not a Monsanto product. It's a rice that has been fortified with beta carotene, which is the precursor to vitamin A. Now, there is a huge problem of vitamin A deficiency in India and Southeast Asia and Africa that causes blindness, maternal mort mortality, and, and death. And this rice, um, test fields of the rice, have been vandalized by Greenpeace and anti-GMO activists. This is just one example of, of this kind of vandalism. And it's, it's kind of funny because anti-biotech folks will say, there's not enough testing of these, of these products. But then they destroy the test fields. Some people say, even, even if genetically engineered foods are, are, are fine for our health, they're bad for the environment, so I'm being, I'm being responsible by avoiding them. That's another myth. Um, again, this is kind of um, a simplified explanation. It's memes. Um, then again, the reason we use memes is because people like memes on the internet these days. So, so I'm sticking with them um, for the purpose of this, of this talk. So GMOs have helped reduce greenhouse gas emissions equivalent to removing 11 point million cars from the road for, for a year. And they have increased farmers' yields. Without GMOs, we'd need to add 15.1 million hectares of farmland to maintain food production rates. And I mean, that's the area the size of, an area the size of Illinois, when you put it all together. It's pretty big. Um, if, you're, if you're doubting any of what I say to you, uh, feel free to visit my, my Facebook page or Mammoth's Facebook page, that's even better. There are citations for all of these. And these are some of my favorites because I made these memes and I'm not really good at them, so, um, but I'm kind of proud of these. So GMOs are bad because food shouldn't be patented. Life shouldn't be patented. GM seeds are not the only seeds with intellectual property rights. 
almost all conventional non-GM and organic hybrid seeds are patented and they can't be saved for use in the next planting season legally. Um, a, an example of this is the first non-GMO project verified apple called the Opal Apple. It has a patent on it, but it's not something that they're going to talk about very openly. It takes years of R&D followed by navigating a stringent, uh, I, I would say unscientific and ideologically based regulatory process to get um, GM varieties and non-GM varieties from the lab bench to, to the dinner plate. So, I mean, in, in this day and age, you're not simply going to let your IP go unless you're, you're a charity organization. And believe me, the organic industry is not, um, <laughs> not a nonprofit organization. The bees, though, the bees. If you go to any um, anti-GMO protest or event, you will see people dressed as bees, babies dressed as bees, everyone, a lot of people dressed as bees, um, collapsing, uh, like I said, very theatrical. But um, colony collapse disorder is definitely a real phenomenon influenced by complex factors that I'm not gonna get into today. A relatively new class of insecticides thought to be less harmful to beneficial pollinators called uh, neo neonics um, have been blamed by the anti-GMO leadership for colony collapse disorder and, um, and the death of bees. And, and these, um, these chemicals are often used on genetically engineered crops. Um, so it, the bees have become a big symbol used to de demonize agricultural biotechnology. Again, a myth. People say that there aren't consumer benefits uh, to agricultural biotechnology, that it only benefits the corporations and sometimes only benefits the farmers. But um, we, have, we have items now that benefit the consumer. And if it weren't for ideological, non-evidence-based lobbying and, and fear, there, there would be a lot more that we could have. Um, things we do have, um, non-browning apples are about to hit the market. They're called Arctic apples. They come in several varieties. And you cut them open or bite into them. And they don't turn brown. And some people will say use lemon juice. Um, but I, I kind of want non-browning apples. <laughs> um, and they also don't bruise, and that reduces waste. Again, um, this is beneficial for the environment. Um, we have non-browsing lower acrylamide potatoes about to hit the market as well. I've tried them. They're delicious. They taste exactly like potatoes, <laughs> except they don't turn brown. And again, they, they reduce waste because they don't they don't bruise. Um, you don't get those black spots when you open them up. Um, acrylamide is, again, a, a compound thought to be harmful when, um, when coffee beans are roasted and also when potatoes are cooked at high temperatures like frying. Um, and, and these potatoes have lower ac acrylamide levels. Stuff we could have, I mentioned golden rice. Um, Tear-free onions. I don't know how exciting that is to you guys. Um, I don't cook a whole lot. My husband usually does that. But when I do, the, the onions really get me. And they, there were tear-free onions that existed, um, but they didn't get to, um, to development and commercialization. Um, and I've, I've asked people, what would you like to see um, to be as a benefit of, of genetic engineering, and I often hear non-browning avocados. Actually, there is a group of people on social media that's been um, asking the company, it's a small company that created the non-browning apples to create non-browning avocados, Okanagan Specialty Fruits, and they say, you guys, we don't do avocados, we do apples, <laughs> but it's a dream and I hope it comes true. Um, mom harder. On the, on the left you see moms across America 
And on the right, you see the moms for GMOs. The moms for GMOs is this letter that I mentioned. Um, and in that picture, you see, um, let's see, on the upper left, Joni Kamiya. She's the Hawaiian daughter of a papaya, GMO papaya farmer. Um, we have a blogger, uh, Sarah Schultz, and mom from, from a blog called Nurse Loves Farmer. Uh, Jenny Splitter, one of my fellow Grounded Parents writers, me, and um, there are also three scientists um, it, pictured here, Dr. Anastasia Bodnar, Dr. Leila Kadirai, and Dr. Allison Bernstein. So here's a situation in which mom does know best. So listen to these moms. And on the left, we have the moms across America. Uh, you have a lot of little kids which I find problematic at these protests because um, they don't really understand the, the science and social issues around this. You see a sign that says, I'm not a science experiment. Uh, I see that a lot. And it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. But um, on the left side, about two from the left, there's a woman by the name of Zen Honeycutt. She is an anti-GMO activist, anti-vaxxer. She, um, she believes and promotes the idea that GMOs cause all kinds of health problems from autism to mental illness to cancer. And she believes that she cured her son's autism symptoms, she says autism symptoms, with an organic diet. She went on the Dr. Oz show last fall and without any skepticism whatsoever, Dr. Oz invites her on stage. She describes um, that the, the herbicide glyphosate caused her son's autism symptoms and that six weeks later, uh, after she switched him to an organic diet, his autism magically disappeared. Without any mention of the fact that there's, there's more and more research coming out that shows that, um, that people on the autism spectrum, uh, it's caused by a complex interaction of variations across genetic loci. Uh, no, 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 none of that. It's GMOs. Um, and, and this is victim blaming uh, among a lot of other problems. I had a brief encounter with her last year at Mammoths in Chicago because she happened to be there um, for uh, the Who's Who of Autism Woo conference that was also there. I won't, I won't mention the name of it, but she was there giving a speech. And I went up to her and I said, hello. Um, she knew exactly who I was. She had um, previously gone on a, on a radio show saying that my name was made up. Um, that I had to be paid off in order to express these opinions. But anyway, she, she asked me um, how I could possibly, quote, risk my children if there was even one study showing harm from GMOs. And I kept trying to explain to her the difference between cherry picking and scientific consensus. Um, and she kept using the word risk. So I asked my co-founder, Dr. Carl Haro von Mogel, a geneticist, um, to kind of discuss with her a little bit about risk. I was being very, very level-headed and calm at this time. And he stepped in just, you know, to start speaking, and he, she stops him. She says, are you a dad? And he said, not yet. And, and you will not believe what she said. She said, well, then I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to her. You haven't had life come from your body so, so you don't get to talk, essentially. <laughs> so expertise, um, motherhood trumps expertise in these situations, apparently. So the next few slides are going to use Zen Honeycutt as an example. Um, and I'm doing this because she's, she's such a good example of the mom shaming and the mom harder concept. So food allergies. On the left, you see a tweet from Jenny Splitter, who um, is also a Mammoths member, and she has uh, one child with food allergies. Uh, and she tweeted, shame on moms across America. Um, and she had uh, posted a blog explaining how at a Mammoths event in DC, the moms across America kept accusing her of causing her children's 
food allergy issues. And Moms Across America tweets, the damage can be reversed. I'm sorry you can't find it in you to protect your child. So, I mean, this is, this is the kind of tone that's very common. It doesn't end with food allergies. Birth defects. I mean, Zen Honeycutt just pops up like she's some kind of Poe, but she's real. Like, these are real tweets. The Daily Mail tweets, baby born with 12 fingers and 12 toes, and doctors have no idea why. Zen Honeycutt. At Daily Mail UK, glyphosate Roundup causes birth defects and is sprayed on our food. Oh, Zen, thank you. Now we have the answer to, uh, to this babies that doctors cannot figure out. Um, and it doesn't end at birth defects. Infertility. This is the Thanks Obama edition. At Barack Obama, teen pregnancies are at an all-time low because our people are being sterilized by glyphosate in our food and water. Uh, I don't know how many of you are parents, um, and if you are, um, or if you want to be one, try switching to organic and, and see if that helps. But I mean, I don't mean to kind of make a joke out of it because it's not. And on the right here is a quote from, from my book, The Fear Babe. The study wasn't done on, on live rats. She's talking about a study that was done on rat testicular cells in culture. And the most important part is that 36 parts per million, uh, what these rat te testicular cells were exposed to, is way higher than typical residues found on crops, which is around one part per million. So I, I kind of joke about this. But you don't want to pour Roundup on your genitalia that would be unlikely to render you infertile, but um, let's keep our, our birth control methods, people. <laughs> so here's a picture of, of uh, Sarah Michelle Geller. And this is what kind of started the Moms for GMOs campaign and letter. The, the picture there has the hashtag conceal or reveal. I'm signing the Conceal or Reveal petition to tell them they have to be on the side of moms. And then below it you'll see, just label it, uh, we have the right to know. Um, just label it is funded by the organic industry. And if you think back to an earlier slide, that meme that showed the mom who was a better researcher than the FBI was um, a meme from a blog and website called Momovation. Momovation and just label it partner very frequently to do anti-GMO campaigns. So this is a very kind of small, close-knit world of, of anti-GMO activism. The, the combination of celebrity and motherhood is extremely powerful, right? We, we trust mothers, we know that they're worrying about their kids, and we're a culture that loves celebrities. So when you take someone like Buffy and, and have her hold up the sign, that says she just wants to know what they're feeding, what she's feeding her kids. If, if you don't understand the nuances and details of the issue, then, then yeah, you're gonna think, I love Buffy, I love my kids, I, want an, I have a right to know what's in my food. Um, just Label It is, is headed by Gary Hirschberg, the CEO of Stonyfield Organic, and um, if you go down the rabbit hole of these organic industry big wigs, following them on social media, you will not even believe the things that they tweet or that they comment on Facebook. It's, it's, it doesn't seem real. Um, so Dr. Leila Katiri, Dr. Allison Bernstein, and um, Dr. Anastasia Bodnar messaged me on Facebook when this came out and they said, we cannot have this. I mean, this is Buffy and scientists love Buffy. We have to do something about this. Again, here we have um, anti-GMO kids. Um, it, does anything sound weird about that statement? I mean, it's kind of like saying, maybe not as extreme, but it's like saying, um, I was born Christian, or I was born um, Muslim. 
these kids aren't anti-GMO. They're being handed signs, and they stand there, and then they're used as props in this, in this anti-GMO ideological movement. So they're, they're too young to understand the scientific and social issues surrounding these technologies, and they're, they're exploited. Okay, so I know that um, it's the end of the con and everyone's ready to go, so I'll leave you with, with a video from the upcoming Science Moms documentary. Um, a, a couple, a married couple, uh, who are documentarians were inspired by the Moms for GMOs letter, which I hope that, that all of you will take the time to read, um, and they decided to make a documentary called Science Moms. So when they were filming with me, they, um, they decided to just give me a number of quick statements that uh, were uttered by celebrities and asked me for my very quick response. So here's what I said when they asked what I thought about Gwyneth Paltrow's statement that um, she would rather smoke crack than eat cheese from a tin. That's, yeah, that's the end of that clip, but the Facebook page for Science Moms has uh, a couple of these clips and some more coming up, and I'm sure they would be thrilled if you, if you followed them. Um, they'll be crowdfunding the documentary soon and traveling around the country to interview science activists and scientists who happen to also be parents. Um, so that's the end for today, thank you. Um, this is the end again of the con, but I'm happy to speak with people on social media. Um, my email address is, is um, listed on my Twitter page. So um, think of this as the beginning of a dialogue. Um, I always think that communicating about these issues is a marathon and not a, not a sprint. I don't expect to have swayed or convinced any of the anti-GMO people here today, but feel free to ask me questions. Thanks.